Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is our state license requirements uh, working group, and this is 2:30 to 3:30 today. We have 13 people who have signed up, and we have eight people on the line. Cass will go ahead and do the roll. Steve O'Neill. John Simone Pietre. Al. Potter. Lynn Drill. I'm here. Wilson. Tillman. I'm here. Jolera. Hi. Kim Byers. I'm here. Kevity. Hansberry. Present. Tibbet. Present. Is it on the call who I haven't called? Okay, you know, I just jumped on. And, and who else was that? Uh, on Okay. And then county staff. Angelo? Here. Ann Curry? Here. Nash Gonzalez? Here. Mary Lynn? Present. Ryan May? Sarah Cat? Here. David? Present. And anyone else? County staff? This is Kevin. I just joined. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining us. Okay, well, with uh, phone conference, we uh, get a little uh, more astute at what we're doing here. The difficulty is that some people are just on their phones and others are by a computer. And so with that, uh, we cannot mute everyone. We can't have you just put it up and then we can call on you. So it's been a bit of a challenge. So if you start talking and we stop you, it's because there is a conversation happening or a staff person is answering a question. So we'll do what we can, again, for this call to try to be as orderly as we can. The first item is the ground rules and call procedures. I'm not going to go over the ground rules except to say that please be courteous and civil when you um, speak up and when you are asking or answering a, a question. And the goal of this uh, working group is really to look at the state licensing requirements and see how we want to proceed together as a community uh, along with the Board of Supervisors in, in uh, reviewing state regs and also working with the state. So we will go into a discussion in a minute, but just to let you know what we did with the other two working groups. We asked for questions ahead of time, and yes, I know that we asked for questions yesterday for today, and please um, please, please be aware that, uh, you know, the direction of the board was to move on the working groups as quickly as we could, and so therefore, we are trying to do a working group call every week, which does not uh, permit a lot of time in between to either work on the schedule or work on any type of, of handouts that we would share or the information that you're giving us. So we will try to do better with that, but it, it's just the nature of how quickly we're working. One other thing when we're talking about state requirements, we're also talking about amendments, uh, amendments as well. So we just need to keep that in mind. So what we did again for the last two working groups is in light of the number of people that we had on those Call went to the uh, questions that the participants had already submitted, and we started there. So I would like to do the same thing with the state license requirement work group. And the first question we have is from Paul Hansberry and Susan Tibbon. So Paul or Susan, if you would like to start, that would be great. Paul, this, you go ahead. This is Paul Hansberry, um, and uh, I wanted. To the people at their laptop, I don't know if you know how to raise your hand or not, but if you click on the participants icon at the top right-hand side, you'll see where that little hand icon is at the bottom, and you can uh, click on that to raise your hand. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, I, I'm not prepared. I was supposed to have a, a meeting with some of the people from the state, with uh, Senator McGuire's office, regarding local temporary nonprofit license within the um, in Taylor bill under uh, 2607.5. Where the local jurisdiction, the authority to create a new license, and not charge uh, administrative fees or taxes, um, and it's a feasibility study that the state is doing, uh, where they could create a medical cottage industry license that would parallel a my business license for use. Um, the one thing that I wanted to talk about was serving versus dosage for medical and adult use. Uh, Non-volatile methods for ethanol, um, like uh, soaking as, as in a tincture, um, or using a, a, a tabletop distillery. Distiller. The discrepancy between uh, the uh, cottage outdoor and the state level is for 25 plants, and that's the only time that the plant count is stipulated. Everything else is canopy. And the personal use for Mendocino is 100 square feet versus six required by the doctor. Um, so I want to throw those things on the table and I want to let people know that Susan and I have both been made several trips to Sacramento, spoken with several uh, in the office of several assemblymen and senators and the governor's office addressing all these issues. Um, and I will uh, try to have more information by the next um, um, conference. That's a great update from you. Thank you. And I think you bring up some good points that we will be discussing as we move forward over the weeks with this particular uh, working group. I don't know. Susan. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah. Um, thank you, Paul. And I just wanted to emphasize on the college outdoor 25 plants, which again, as Paul said, is the only time we can get plant count. For those of us who are focused on ratio-specific medicines, we must grow the more fragile, smaller, usually, CBD plants. So um, it presents uh, a, a, you know, both an economic and a logistical problem if we're limited to just 25 plants in terms of yield. And that's where that's, where that's sort of coming from and why that seems extremely unfair and perhaps we can work on that. Thanks. Okay. We have assurances from the, from Sacramento that it, that will be addressed and and probably changed. They, they view it as an oversight. That we talk to. Okay, great. You know, one more comment before we proceed. Uh, a question came up in the last meeting about I think it was Julia who asked about a transcript. I initially said we're not doing that. I was inaccurate, and Cass did say that there is a transcript of every one of these calls. So if you have to get off the call or you miss something, you will be able to, we will send you the link and you'll be able to get the transcript and, and hear what happened during the call. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. With that, moving along, if we can go then to the next participant on our list who submitted questions, and that's Julia Carrera. Julia, are you on the call? I'm, thank you, Ms. Carmel. So the, I submitted um, uh, five questions. Um, the first had to do with maximum square footage for cultivation. Since this is a working group about state regulations, uh, I just believe that Mendocino County is not doing itself a favor by limiting square footage to 10,000 square feet. And I'm hoping that we won't repeat what happened in Mendocino County with the Vintners, where Sonoma County and Napa County were very open to the their industry. Um, I'm hoping that Mendocino County will open up even more to the cannabis industry, and we might see an increase so that uh, the market is viable for the Mendocino County product. I also submitted a question about um, and Specifically, there's a conflict between the state offices and departments and Mendocino County offices and department states. Um, I submitted a question about micro business license, and Paul kind of touched on some of what I was trying to get at. And um, some kind of micro license in Mendocino County 
will be a very viable option for the success of the Mendocino County small farmer, and it's in the economic best interest of the county to nurture some form of that license. Um, I asked if Mendocino County would be lobbying the state uh, for state regulation uh, changes that support the small farmer of Mendocino County. I used the example of the current caps on collectives at the state, state level. And my last question was about state environmental requirements. My um, question was, how actually is the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board going to uh, end or continue their program, and how will that transfer into the California Department of Fish and Wildlife program, and how will it be implemented other than what I've heard from that? our acting Ag Commissioner Diane Curry that, that they will be having a self-check um, need for um, enrollment in the CBFW program. I also asked if the compliance unit, the upcoming compliance unit in Mendocino County could have an environmental component that's like a one-stop shop so that applicants can come there and understand what they need to do before they get started for site viability. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you, Julia. So uh, how about any comments from anyone else on Julia's six questions? And I don't know if any of our staff want to comment on any of Julia's questions. I, I have something that I'd like to say, but I will wait until afterwards. Um, this is Casey. I would comment when when appropriate. You can, you can now it's fine, Casey. Um, I would definitely second the need for looking at the micro business. The, the way the state, um, uh, the UMA intended micro business was for the ability for farms under 10,000 square feet, which is the only thing that Mendocino County currently authorizes, to be able to vertically integrate, to be able to participate in all of the different market steps. The way the Planning Commission and the board have currently discussed them is, is as though it's something new and different as opposed to a way to allow the existing farms to augment their processes. And so, for instance, um, discussion has been about whether micro business should be authorized in only industrial or in industrial and commercial, which flies in the face of the idea that micro business should be authorized for all of the existing farms so that they can engage in these processes of getting their product to market on their own, uh, um, be able to send their product themselves. So some, some direct support from the county in terms of the micro business, especially given, as Julia noted, that um, micro businesses are all that are authorized in Mendocino County, it would be extremely important for us to get out in front of this thing. Um, also, the question was raised about the cooperative, the, the ag cooperative model um, and the four acre cap, which I think is, you know, is another thing that we were surprised about. Um, and as a participant in a cooperative, we're currently trying to figure out how do we deal with this? Do we disband and form multiple cooperatives? How do we work on this? So that is also a, a, a big question for me. Could interject real fast. I did ask if at some point we could create a working group for the micro business license or whatever the county chooses to call it. Thank you. I would also support that. If I, if I could ask something, um, I know that everyone on the county level. So this is Paul Hansbury. Okay. Everyone in the county and staff are working very hard, and this is a Herculean task to, to do. On some levels, the perception is, and I'm from a number of people, that the, um, certain aspects of staff and, and certain departments should be more interested in, in defending their position rather than trying to come up with a, a workable solution. And so they'll defend it with current code rather than trying to use the code to find a solution. And would, I would really uh, uh, encourage uh, people to talk about that and finding a solution rather than trying to uh, sh uh, shoehorn these regulations into existing. I will second and support that as well. Okay, go ahead, Mary Lynn. So this is Mary Lynn from Planning. The business topic is some that we've not spent very much time on, and we have talked with our consultants after the last Planning Commission meeting that we need to um, take a closer look at that. So we are working on that aspect of it. We, we kind of got, I guess we didn't understand the bulk of it until we started hearing comments at the Planning Commission meeting. 
so as far as working group, I think that's, I don't know if that's something we'll put together, but we are taking a closer look at that. Any other comments from staff? I might also add that the micro business under state law is for adult use only, and there's no provision currently for medical uh, industry. Is, is Ken on the call? Ken on the call? What? Okay. All right, so I would make um, a comment. I think he just... The I think he's just no, there he is. There. Okay. Kevin? Do you want to use Waxies as a management company and a different one to name the uh, delivery uh, service? Is someone up there? Or do you... I mean, you can do a DBA you don't want to like advertise yourself as Waxy. You don't have to advertise yourself as Waxy. You can also use Waxy as a profit. Which and one will be banking? Which one will be banking? Please the put your phone on mute. Okay, anything else? I'm going to answer um, a joint question about the uh, an environmental component to the cannabis unit. Just developing the cannabis unit, and that is something we are open to. I I, uh, I don't have an answer right now, but we we could look at that. So that was we only received questions uh, for this call from Paul, Susan, and Julia. So at this point in time, we only have 13 people on this call. So are there other uh, questions or key issues? But anyone else would like to uh, throw into the ring here as we develop our agenda moving forward on the state license requirement? Go, Anna. Yeah, um, a couple of items. One is the very important distinctions between provisional licenses that the state is going to offer not only at the state level to be a bridge while people get their final documents in order and while they wait for the state to process their state licenses, but also there is specific provisions to have provisional local licenses that was authorized by SB 94. So that's one topic. The second topic is, uh, and so what we need to actually have in place, because unlike the uh, kind of, I'm going to call them permanent licensing processes, even though I recognize it's not really permanent, it's just the normal as opposed to provisional. The normal uh, state licensing process gives the county the three options that county council has previously enunciated in terms of an affirmative response that somebody is okay versus keeping silent versus an affirmative response that they're not okay. It also further allows the county to jump in at any time in the process to say that somebody's in violation of something. That is very different in the kind of normal licensing process than what is required for an applicant to obtain a provisional license. And I believe that provisional licenses are going to be absolutely critical for Mendocino County cannabis businesses, whether they're cultivators or otherwise. Partly because CDW and other agencies has not yet figured out their processes of determination of whether you need a 1602 agreement or not, and whether they're going to create a desktop process or not, whether or not the building issues are taking, you know, I mean, there's just so many things that are going to make it as a practical reality necessary for people to apply for provisional license to be able to still conduct business. While it's true that SB 94 also allows the cooperative, the regular collective model to continue, the problem is if state license, whether provisionally licensed or permanently licensed facilities will actually accept cannabis products or, or raw cannabis from uh, collective models, 
or whether they're going to require people to have provisional licenses. So all of that in short to say that I think that we need to not gloss over how county needs to be proactive, getting people lined up by the end of November, because again, applications start in December, provisional licenses, uh, and have a process in place. And as we know, the months just speed up by, and while it may seem like next year, reality is people are going to have to have something affirmative in their hand in November, in December, they can provide it to the state to apply for a provisional license. Thank you. Those are very good points, and we will add them to the list of topics um, that will develop as, as we move forward. Okay. Uh, Thank I'm you. I'm going to try Kevin one more time. Kevin, are you there? Okay, let's go to somebody he, else who hasn't talked yet. Okay. He's there for He's just off on the other line for a second. Okay, we'll get back to him. How about Jude? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I really like the list of issues that have been laid out so far by um, Paul and Julia. I certainly echo the things that he and Hannah have said. Um, this provisional license is a permit for the local permits. It's going to be so critical, especially since nobody should be able to do anything solid. It's uh, our coastal zone and all of our entrepreneurs and cultivators there. Um, I wanted to just add some information which I can bring uh, to the working group as we proceed in more detail. But with regard to ethanol, I, I think it would also be important for the county to take a proactive and progressive stance in the direction of moving ethanol to the nonviolent, uh, to nonviolent, non-volatile solvent uh, side of the uh, equation. Um, and just cite two, two facts that would uh, support doing that so that we can include um, ethanol use in purging of CO2 manufacturing in uh, the um, type 6 uh, zones. Uh, one AB 2679, which allows for the use of solvents that are generally recognized as safe pursuant to the FDA Act, and uh, food grade ethanol is a liquid solvent used in many forms of processed foods in which it is necessary to remove lipids from oils. Oh, another uh, fact that's useful for us in our crafting, our policy is the Colorado revised statutes define inherently hazardous substances as, quote, any liquid chemical compressed gas or commercial product that has a flash point at or lower than 38 degrees Celsius or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, including butane, propane, and dialyl ether, and excluding all forms of alcohol and ethanol. So uh, we, need, we need to jump on this bandwagon to, to help um, our manufacturers stay in Mendocino. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone in the room that just would make a comment on the ethanol issue? I have a comment. Of what goes, what the process is. So we remove 
the I, I, I think you're correct. Yeah. After so, did, you comment. Did everyone on the call hear what Sarah just said? No. 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 Please repeat that, or, or Mary Lynn. Well, I, I think in the um, facilities, the cannabis facility ordinance, I think actually removed the, the specific um, type of, of element would be used. I think we left. We, it's more generalized, and I can't remember yeah, the exact. We, I think we the definition is more about the process, and then anyone that's using any type of chemical is going to go through our normal process for hazardous material right. if you're using it, but. We did, I believe we took out any mention to specific uh, salt. Okay, I think we are on to Casey. You would like to say something, we'll go to you. And then after that, Kevin, if you're on the call, um, we'll go to you after Casey. Go ahead, Casey. Okay, two brief comments. Um, one, we're going to run into a difference in canopy definition, in which the county went actual canopy, which was pretty crucial given the fact that um, you know, we are limiting size of the cultivation, and so actual plant canopy has enabled cultivators to spread their plants out um, and and grow a fair amount of cannabis. Uh, the state, it, it looks like, and I'm not entirely certain on this, but it does look like the state is going to go more a square footage based model, um, which could run up against, you know, people having to redo their gardens, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it would be good for the county to sort of push um, the definition that we've been using as something functional, especially given the fact that we're limited to 10,000 square feet. Um, so we could say, look, because we're 10,000 square feet and under, we went with this definition and we think this should do the same, something like that. Um, the other thing is that in the, uh, the trailer bill, we lost the ability for farms to transport product off the farm. And so currently, um, it's the way it reads right now, a distributor has to pick up the product from the farm, whether it's raw product or trimmed. Uh, and that was a huge, huge step backwards. And so one of the things that we're working on is an amendment, you know, an, uh, essentially a, another trailer bill or an amendment to the trailer bill that would allow for some sort of transport from the farm to the distributor so that there's not that added cost to the farmer when a lot of times it's like if we can bring it off the hill ourselves, you know, it dovetails with a trip to town. So that's something I think is going to be very, very important for the county to, to signal to Sacramento that we think our farmers should be able to transport their product. Thank you for that. And, you know, that's just the type of information that we want to talk about because we, we would like to work together um, as far as the, the community, the stakeholders, and the county, as far as presenting uh, any information or any potential changes uh, to the state. So thanks for that. Kevin, are you Thank there you. now? Okay. Well, yes, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, it was the, the muting. It was kind of weird on the app, but I'm here. Okay, Kevin, when I, when I wanted you to speak, it was because there was a lot of discussion around micro-businesses, and I know that's one of your key issues. So at this point, is there anything you'd like to comment on? Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I just, there's so many disconnection between the state law and the and what we have. Um, but I just, I just want to make sure that we we're aware that I, th I do think that's a very valuable license for for all the small farmers around in Mendocino and, and however we can make that work for them in terms of building and planning uh, if they could do uh, manufacturing at least just class six uh, I mean type six and and also uh, maybe retail on their own facility just if we were setting everything has to be done in industrial zone or things like that, it's going to be very difficult for them to find multiple locations and properties to do this. Um, and also, we have the problem that if they already have a cultivation license, do they have to apply that again, or how would that be incorporated? Um, but at the same time, I just don't feel we even have enough information from the state level at this point. Uh, so another thing I want to bring up is for the working group to continue moving forward, is there any uh, one source that we can maybe get some uh, weekly or bi-weekly update? Because I know you guys probably have more venue and resource from the level to, to give us the more updated information. But uh, um, otherwise, we're just kind of 
kind of thing I'm waiting on on email that's being sent out eventually so uh if there is some sort of information update that we can get to um the that all the information that you you guys been receiving that'll be helpful for us to move forward and I uh, really uh, nail down the details. Okay, so Kevin, that's that's another good suggestion. What we could do is, is we could add as a, a first agenda item to these calls. We would do a state update. Um, additionally, we do um, do updates to the board as needed. So we could want a mechanism where if there's information that we get, we could absolutely either send it out in an email to this group or whatever, but we have no issue sharing information as we get it. Though I do have to say that the people on this call, I learn a lot about what's happening at the state from the very people on this call. So I think we have um, a lot of talent here on this call as far as people who are very astute at going to the state and trying to uh, affect policy change. So maybe we could all work together and with these state requirement working group calls, we could start as an agenda item of just sharing information about state contacts and what we've learned. I'll ask, ask to add that to the agenda. So thank so, you, Kevin. Yeah, and, and just on that point, then uh, recently they just uh, passed a new bill that will, that will allow medical and recreational use on the same premises. So at least I just want to throw that out there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, did you have something to say? Yeah, um, I yourself. Sarah at Executive Office, that there's going to be a lot of state stuff that comes out in the next few weeks as they finish their session and we see which bills are successful. And then as a working group, we're going to have to do a quick turnaround of when the emergency regs come on board because I think out of this working group, the intent is to have comments to the state. Uh, so there's going to be it's going to move pretty quickly over the next. So so I just want to reiterate for those of you that Sarah's on the other end of the table here, so you may not have heard her, but our, our goal is, is that we will give comments to the state as uh, there are revisions um, to bills, and so we want to work together on that. So we absolutely will be sharing information and working together. Now there are just a couple people who are on the call who haven't spoken, so I want to go down. Um, Paul and Susan, you've, you have uh, shared information and asked your question, so has Kevin. Karen Byers, are you still on the call? I don't think we've heard from you. Paul, and I'm just really listening and absorbing. and. Um really support moving towards the micro business. I was a big proponent of Proposition 64 because of that. So, um, you know, since the state is definitely moving forward, but I'd love to see Mendocino take the lead also. Okay. Well, Karen, thank you for your comments. I'd like to see Mendocino County take the lead as well. So thank you. So Julia and Jude and Hannah have talked. Ellen, Ellen uh, Jarrell, you haven't said much. Would you like to make some comments or ask some questions? I'll, I'll make a comment. Um, I'm also very much in the learning mode, and I'm pretty, ama well, a little bit um, uh, overwhelmed by the complexity of, of working with state, especially since both the state and the county are moving targets. So anyway, uh, hats off to everybody who's grappling with this. and. and and attempt to stay on top of it and be influential, not just follow it, but actually guide it. So um, anyway, kudos to everybody. I'm particularly interested in the distinction between what the state considers to be um, a suitable pesticide use on um, medical marijuana and, and the distinction between that and the equivalent of organic standards that came up at the, the supervisor's meeting on Tuesday, and I guess this would be a question or a comment mainly to Diane Curry, possibly, that um, that anyway, it would just be really clear to us and to the Board of Supervisors exactly what the difference is at this point, and also, is that a moving target also on the part of the state? Because 
I'm looking at one of these registration requirements. It says, under California law, the only pesticide products not illegal to use on marijuana are those that contain an active ingredient that's exempt from residue tolerance requirements, and then it refers you to an attachment, which isn't attached. And so, anyway, the, the devil is in the detail on these things, and I know that sometimes these requirements change. So I'm just very interested in in working with people to stay on, on top of all of that. This year, I could actually respond to that briefly. Um, one of the main differences is that the state pesticide levels are significantly more restrictive than an organic certified program because most of the Omri, CCLF, et cetera, certified products are certified for consumption as opposed to for combustion. And so the pesticides are dramatically more strict than organic but that doesn't get into the inputs in terms of fertilizers, the use of chemical fertilizers, et cetera. And so that's where the main difference in terms of the organic standard is going to come, is that the state isn't having anything to say about fertilizer regimens. They're only on the pesticide issue. And so while the pesticides are dramatically more strict, the fertilizer has, they're essentially silent on the fertilizer issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Casey. Further clarification? This is Hannison on the pesticide issue. The additional information, Ellen, is that one problem that cannabis farmers are having being located if counties and cities and locales are requiring them to be next to traditional on ag um, zoned land and traditional ag farmers are using uh, that are not allowed there's substantial drift, so crops that are being tested with cannabis, even if they use more stringent standards, are being filled because they're next to, let's say, blueberry fields or something else that do uh, not have as stringent standards. So that's an, another unintended consequence of requiring only ag um, zoning uh, for cannabis cultivation is that but up against stringent. We'll hear from the Ag Commissioner. Diane, did you want to say a couple things here? Yes, this is Diane Curry. Um, I just wanted to um, say she's correct in the fact that that's the difference between organic. There's a little bit more involved in it. But, uh, currently, I think, you know, the state is being mandated to come up with some of those residue tolerances which the state does not normally do. That's usually done by um, Fed EPA. So there, you know, we will see more products coming online that may or may not fit into OMRI approved or organic approved. So we'll just see how that, you know, what that, adding more chemicals in the future, I'm sure. And as far as, you know, drift in agricultural lands, you know, applications are supposed to stay on site. You know, if something, you know, if a product would go for testing and comes up positive for, like, glyphosate or something, then, you know, we can certainly be an investigation into that. But that certainly doesn't, that would then becomes a civil matter between you and the person who drifted on you. So, I mean, that's not helpful, but you know, it certainly could happen. Thank you, Dan. Paul Hansberry wanted to speak. Go ahead, Paul. Hi. Uh, a couple of things. Um, the, with regards to that uh, temporary nonprofit license, I submitted something to the board that uh, was um, uh, outlined for a potential for a, a, a age industry license and parameters for that, utilizing AB 16 for the whole kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, and I'm willing to work with anyone who's trying to hammer out some language for micro business and and uh, help help with the language with that. Secondly, um, Sue and I have been to Sacramento many times and visited many assemblymen and the uh, governor's office, but it's a while for us to be able to, be able to get the appointments. If there's someone um, in the government, in the Mendocino government, uh, Carl or uh, maybe a board member that could serve as an advocate because they've got a little bit more juice so they could 
advocate for Mendocino County instead of waiting to see what the, what the state's going to do, to give them feedback to sh say, we would like to do this. Can you put this? Can you introduce this? And there are certain people that are known quantities that are architects or that are writing these laws, and they, they would have a, a much easier um, access to those people than Susan and I would, although we're doing our best. Yeah, Paul, Paul very good comments and good suggestions. And, um, you know, we, we work with our representatives just as you. I think somebody, it might have been you, Paul, uh, who talked about a meeting with McGuire's office. We're in regular contact. I mean, I can tell you I just had a conversation with Jim Wood just a couple hours ago. We, my board members and myself are in regular contact uh, with our representatives, just as some of you are, and also our statewide association. So again, I think uh, our hope is that we could come out as a working group with really good key points and recommendations that we could bring to the board, and once the board is in agreement and blesses the work, we can move forward with um, not only uh, sending, you know, letters to the state, but also uh, advocating for Mendocino County collectively. So that's definitely part of the plan. You're on target there, Paul, and more to come on that once we have a, a little better understanding of what we really want to move forward on. Um, I'm, it is about, we have about 10 more minutes on the call. I want to make sure that everybody that wanted to talk uh, has an opportunity to had an opportunity to do that. And if there was anything that we missed, I say you you have uh, submitted some very good uh, questions, and we will use the questions that we have here. Particularly, there's been issues around not only micro business but the provisional local permits. You've also talked about. Um, uh, some different vol uh, volatile versus non-volatile and moving forward with that. So I think we've got some good key points that we could use for our agenda for our next meeting. But before we talk about next steps, any other comments or questions from anyone on the call? Thank you, Casey. I think that Casey's point about the change of um, transportation from the farm no longer being viable is a significant impact to Mendocino County, and I think we should put that in our next meeting. It's substantial, the impact here in this county from that new law. Thank you. Great. Casey, did you want to say something? Just add briefly that um, it's going to be pretty imperative for us to stay on top of this, the, the development of this cooperative language and how that works. You know, obviously I'm part of a cooperative project, so I'm concerned about it from the project that I'm participating in, but I also see it as a tremendous potential to really help organize a lot of the cottage industry farms. I think we're going to need some systemic support, both from the county um, and some processes from the state level. And so that's something I think that we should be tracking very, very closely. Okay, and if, thank you. And, and and I, is, Harry, may, may I uh, comment on that? This no, is how I was, Paul, you will be last comment on the line. Go ahead. I think this speaks to what I was uh, saying earlier, the timeliness of this. So in other words, to get the transport back on and let the, the state know like a Mendocino County government official, that this is something that is going to be detrimental to the, the constituents of Mendocino County. Let them know before it has to go through the process of this work group, then present it to the board, and then get their imprimatur, and then get it, by that time the law would have already been passed, and then it would have to undo it. Well, so, so nothing uh, I think <laughs> happened today. Um, and clearly, uh, yeah, I've said this on the other calls, and maybe I didn't say it on this call, but everything that uh, we've talked about will be an update to the board next week on September 19th. So the board will be regularly informed so that they uh, could give direction. 
So we'll work as quickly and closely with you and the board as we can so that we can be proactive. So uh, you're welcome. So I'm going to ask in the room here, because we have all our subject matter experts, anybody would like to make some comments, and then I'll talk about our next meetings and what we're doing after that. So Mary Lynn, I'm going to start with you. Any comments? Okay. Jesse? Anything? Sarah? Do you have anything to say? This is Siobhan from the Agriculture Department. I just wanted to say that um, though there is an evolution as far as the pesticides that will be legally a legal option to use on cannabis, if anyone has questions, please to reach out to the Ag Department and ask to speak to an inspector because it isn't written in stone as of yet, but that is what the inspectors are there for. So if anyone is concerned and wants to check to see if a product makes sense to use, we have people there to help them make that determination and we're more than willing to make sure everyone's safe. So even though we don't know definitively, feel free to reach out to us at any time. And to piggyback on, just to piggyback briefly on that, one of the real issues we're seeing is a lack of separation in the microbiological testing between beneficial and harmful organisms. And so there's a lot of beneficial sprays that have been used in the past that people are not using right now because they're afraid of failing tests, so we're seeing more pest outbreaks as a result. So we're really hoping that the state regs that come down are going to move from this plate count methodology they've been using to the percent by volume method that was suggested in the last draft after the regs, so this is something we're going to stay on top of, but we're really, really hoping to see the ability for beneficial microorganisms to be applied um, based on the testing standards. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, do you have anything to add? Nothing for me. Okay. So uh, just so you know, I've already said that um, September 19th there will be an update to the board. It will be a brief update, but it will cover these four working group calls that we had this week. As far as future uh, calls, we have a working group call for the state requirements scheduled for September 20th, which is next Wednesday from 12.30 to 1.30. And then the fall, September 26th, which is a Tuesday, we have another call scheduled from 12.30 to 1.30. So this will be three weeks, three calls, and then we will determine for um, October 1 how we want to proceed. There has been a lot of interest on the call to have in-person meetings, so I do believe starting October that we will begin in-person meetings, particularly for the larger groups. This is actually a good number of people in this group. and. Um, and some really good input, and, and this is real workable. So those are the meetings. will be phone calls, and we will be looking at in-person meetings starting in October. Uh, we're hoping to actually get a product together to bring to the board within the next few weeks so that we can move this forward, and that certainly is the request of this group. I wonder at this point if I've forgotten anything. I don't think so. So um, it, I think at this point... Excuse me, Paul. This is really relevant on in this forum, but I went to go find out about the uh, weights and measures and the calibration uh, yesterday at the Ag Department, and uh, they said that there was a state regulation for a location fee of ninety dollars, and that's why the farmers a vegetable scale can be brought there, but a retail scale is a location fee, and that's a state fee of ninety dollars. I'm wondering if, if the Mendocino can do the same thing they did for the farmer's market people since they're coming out to the different places for their inspections anyway and can calibrate the scales at that point for a lower fee. Paul, this is Diane Curry. Um, I'm not sure if we are going to be testing at the site. And we are looking into the fact of whether or not you have to be in the uh, device registration program. It's going to kind of depend on what you're doing with the scale. If you're just doing what we call pre-pack, then you wouldn't need that. But if you're actually selling based on what you're weighing on your device, then because of the commercial operation, you would have to be in the device registration. We'll make that exception 
for the um, certified producers at the farmers market because that's something that was built into the legislation because they don't have a site. They're going to the farmer's market, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Well, from a cultivation standpoint, there's not too much difference. Well, and it, like I said, it may be the fact that you don't have to be in the device registration program. It just depends on how product is being Oh. I see. I'll be making uh, more clear on the D schedule. That'd be great. Just awesome. Because we're on this uh, on this issue, I just want to point out that uh, maybe a chance that a steak on the Monday a product that arrive I the, the dispensary has to be the final packaging already. Uh, which is going to cause a lot of problems because, um, uh, well, the dispensary is going to have their tax problem, that's the thing. But, but then does that mean every cultivators, cultivator should have their own uh, packaging license in order to package their own product? Um, or is that going to be some sort of packaging license that c can definitely do that? But then, then we're talking about we have to send post out of two distributors, then do distributors sent back to us to package it or send back to packaging company to take care of that. So so that part uh, is going to be uh, going to need a lot of attention in terms of uh, how expo the farmers can be with uh, packaging and, and final packaging, especially after testing. So. Okay. All right. Well, with that, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being on the call and for all the good information. And we will talk again on September 20th at 1230. Thank you now. Could everyone you have a good afternoon.